Well, good morning and welcome from London to an FS Club webinar. The time is now, the financial impact of the energy transition. Uh, and for those of you who received an email that made you think we might have changed our starting time, no, we're here right now with Kingsmill Bond, an energy strategist from Carbon Tracker, and Mark Campanali, the founder and the executive chairman of Carbon Tracker. Uh, we here at Zien and Long Finance and FS Club have been watching Carbon Tracker for, I think, uh, 15 years now with enormous interest and admiration for the work that they've been doing to identify a very important issue of stranded assets uh, in particular uh, and unburnable carbon. Now, you'll know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. And it really is a privilege to be able to introduce these many webinars. And I can only do so because of the generosity and tolerance of our sponsors as they allow us to range freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today we are most certainly going to be touching on some deep issues to do with uh, the technology that our entire energy industry is founded upon. And we're certainly going to be looking at the financial implications of that. Now, the agenda uh, is going to follow a fairly traditional format. Um, I'm here to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our two experts, Kingsmill and Mark. Uh, they have quite a number of slides to go through, uh, but as ever, I know I have a fast absorption audience out there. And we have three polls as well, so get your fingers ready on the buzzer. A few uh, points. Uh, firstly, the slides are up and available online already. Secondly, the, yes, this is being recorded, and the recording will be posted in approximately uh, 48 hours. And thirdly, any questions that you'd like to feed into the conversation that we'll be having at 1025, please just type them into the GoTo webinar question facility. So no point in emailing me, texting me, or any other various means of connecting me. I'm here with you and Mark in Kingsville. So please feed them in using the question facility. All of those questions with your emails will be sent to Mark and Kingsville. So if there's a point of deep technical issues or you just want to say hi, uh, type it in and we'll make sure that they get them uh, sometime later today and they can reply if, 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 if they're able to. So with no more ado, really, I'd like to hand over uh, to Mark and to Kingsville. The floor is yours, gentlemen. Thank you, Michael. Uh, very much appreciate you giving us the time today to talk about some of our work. So I'm Mark Campanale. Carbon Tracker was set up to answer a few questions around the energy transition. Uh, today, we're going to hear from Kingsmill, who's our lead uh, energy strategist, about the financial impact of the energy transition. Um, so who's controlling the slides? If you can go forward one, please. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to say a few things about who we are. So we're a non-profit financial think tank. So we don't have customers, as it were. Um, we're just entirely funded by foundations like the Rockefeller Brothers Fund uh, and many others whose, work, whose grants we're dependent upon. But the audience for our work is essentially two groups. Firstly, institutional investors, pension funds, investment managers, all kinds of asset owners. And we have an extensive program of exchange of research and ideas about the energy transition with as owners we're probably best known for um, contributing to an initiative called climate action 100 which is this 52 trillion dollar coalition of institutional investors engaging with the world's largest emitters and the second group um, that we uh, show our analysis with is financial market regulators so listing rules stock exchanges central bankers um, the financial stability board the bank of england the TCFD and, and so on and so forth. Our goal as a group is a, a climate secure energy system. So we transition to well below two degrees without disrupting markets. On to the next slide, please. Thank you, Michael. So uh, before handing on to Kingsmill, um, the core thesis, one of the core underlying concepts behind our work at Carbon Tracker is this idea of a global carbon budget. What you're looking at here, I want to look at the top right hand corner those um, uh, polluting um, uh, factories, we're emitting around 42 gigatons, thereabouts, of carbon dioxide per annum, from principally from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, that, that 42 gigatons has to be seen in the context of how many more years of emissions at that level can, can we go before we exceed different warming outcomes. And uh, depending on who you ask and what probability, for about 50%, 60% chance of avoiding one and a half degrees is around four to 500 gigatons, which is that um, white circle 
to 1.75 degrees, it's, it's a little bit more. But the point we're making uh, is a very simple one, which is far more fossil fuels out there we can possibly burn to stay below two degrees. And if we count it down in years, uh, within about a dozen years or so, uh, we'll, we have the conditions um, that we pass through that are equal to one and a half degrees. And then maybe two decades we go through uh, two degrees and then another decade or so after three degrees. And the point about this is we've not seen those levels of warming for, for some three, four hundred. Well, depends who you ask really on this, but we haven't seen concentrations of CO2 for three, four hundred thousand years as we have today. Um, and we'll see warming that the world hasn't seen certainly for millions of years. So it's a bit of a challenge and we're doing it in our lifetime. So I'm going to hand over to Kingsville from this point on. Thank you very much. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. So, um, my name is King Phil Bond and, um, uh, as Mark said, I'm the strategist at, at Carbon Tracker. And, um, so today I, I thought I'd just frame this whole thing in terms of, um, an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. So the unstoppable force of the energy transition meeting the immovable object of the fossil fuel system or the energy system. Um, and what happens when those two collide, uh, is that you, um, get very dramatic consequences. So I'll talk about the first two, and then I'll talk a little bit about why now is the moment where this meeting is happening, and then conclude with with what you can do. So um, so to set the scene, um, as Mark said, there is a climate imperative out there. Um, under business as usual, the, 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 the global warming gets to about four or five degrees, and uh, I think the point simply is, to, to emphasize once more, is that if we are going to get to one and a half or two degrees, you have to peak very, very shortly. In fact, basically now, and it has to start declining very quickly. Um, so before I go any further, I'm going to um, start with a question. So the question is, um, when is peak demand for fossil fuels? I don't know how quick your um, participants are on the, on, the, on the buzzer, Michael. So there's four options, peak demand for fossil fuels, 2019. 2030, 2040, 2050, or 2100. That's great, Kingsville. The poll is open, and as ever, over half the audience have already voted. Two thirds of the audience, three quarters. I'll leave the poll open just a split second longer. Uh, great. We're now up there, uh, just shutting that poll with well over 90% having voted and sharing the results. And over half the audience, 53%, believe that the answer is 2030. Okay. So we also um, have a quick I, comment up here, just a quick one, if you don't mind, Kingsville and Mark. Um, it's from Jasper Sky. For a two-third chance of the temperature remaining below 1.5 degrees to see, the number was supposedly 195 gigatons of CO2 as of January 1st, according to Professor Piers Foster at Al at Leeds. So just where was your 540 number coming from? Yeah, those calculations were done by, well, Carbon Tracker using UNFCCC data and other data sources, actually. And why I said that, depending on who you ask, if people like Jim Hansen uh, are saying, you know, the figures are uh, a lot lower than, than other estimates are. And we're quite conservative, so I personally use the lower end. The difficulty comes is that a lot of the literature and others use probabilities. So you get the 50% probability and the 66% probability and the lower the probability you have the higher the carbon budget i i which is why i don't particularly like it i much rather have a hundred percent certainty of avoiding going past one and a half degrees um because we've not just not seen those temperature levels for for for, for su such a long time or certainly not a modern civilization um now what that means is there's no fossil fuel development anywhere at all from this point on there's no new oil and gas investment for exploration production certainly not for coal and, and that's really the point of this data is is it tells you how much production timeline you've got thank you Derek Kingsville and back to you Kingsville cool. I mean it's also worth noting it's pretty academic when if it's 200 or 400 and we're burning 40 a year I mean you know it's very very soon and 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 as I as I when it started off with you know we have to peak and decline very quickly if you have to have, if we're going to have any chance um, anyway, so let's start talking about the unstoppable forces of change. So the, the good news is that necessity has proven the mother of invention, as so often uh, in human history, necessity has um, 
created this extraordinary technology revolution. So uh, the, the, this concept is pretty well known and appreciated. So you've had this collapse in the cost of, of solar and wind and lithium ion batteries. You've seen an, an exponential growth in, uh, in supply of all three of those technologies. So unfortunately, technology uh, uh, t technology learning curves, as Doyne Farmer points out, are very sticky. So costs are going to carry on falling and growth is going to carry on happening. So anyways, we've got this fantastic technology revolution. Next slide, please. Um, and what it's done, and this is extremely recent. So, I mean, again, I'm, I expect this audience knows this very well, but not everyone does. Um, the economic advantage has passed to renewables in the last uh, two or three years. So the cheapest source of bulk energy uh, electricity generation across the world now from the United States to China, from India to Chile uh, is, is renewables, be it solar or be it wind. Um, and then 90 percent of the world is now the cheapest uh, uh, energy source. And, and indeed, the, the small parts of the world where it's not, it's, got, it's, about to, uh, it's about to be the cheapest energy source. Next slide, please. And furthermore, what's happening in the electricity sector is now spreading right across the rest of the energy complex. So we have this fancy type of framing of how energy transitions work or transitions work in general. You get four phases, spring, summer, autumn and winter. Um, if electricity is in is in phase two, um, uh, then the, uh, the the car sector, for example, is in the spring phase. Um, it's in phase one. And then the, the you have these heavy industry and these hard to solve sectors, which are still in the gestation phase. Um, but, and we can come on to this possibly in a little bit um, of discussion later, but to be clear, um, electricity is 40 percent of primary energy demand, transportation is another uh, 20, light transportation is about another 10. So and, and those two and those two sectors uh, alone are all of the growth in demand. So, again, it's incredibly important what's happening in those sectors. So it's transitions happening one sector after another. Next sector, next slide, please. Um, and it's supercharged by politics. So we deliberately put or I deliberately put in politics after technology because I would suggest that politicians tend to follow technology or be albeit there's a debate as to what degree they've actually encouraged it anyway separate debate um but the point to me is that the governments of the United States and Europe and Japan have pledged to get to net zero emissions by 2050 you can see what that means on this slide you have to go from basically 10 to zero in 30 years time and you've got China by 2060 um, a very near-term peak and then a, a very rapid decline as well. So it's a technology shift supercharged by politics. Next slide, please. Um, and furthermore, it's sequenced by country. So people again often say to me, well, we're not going to have an energy transition because X country isn't doing anything. Um, well, it's the same as anything. You have countries which are leaders and countries which are laggards. And if you take the same type of framework, you know, countries like Denmark and, uh, and, and Germany in a kind of autumn phase of change, um, the big countries of India and, um, uh, and China already now in the summer phase, and then you've got the laggards like the Middle East and the CIS, which are still really in the gestation phase. But the point to me is that it's happening one uh, sector after another, but also one country after another this shift. Next slide, please. Um, and then the, the, the final aspect of the, the energy transition is that it's, it's supercharged, as it were, by this emerging market uh, energy leapfrog. And I'm, I'm, I'm illustrating it here with what's going on in China. So China's the world leader in terms of deployment of really all renewable energy technologies, so solar and wind and uh, uh, long distance transmission lines, electric buses, electric bikes, electric cars. Um, and, 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 and that's a sort of classic example of, of China leapfrogging to this, uh, to this new energy technology. But in fact, an even better example is going to be India. So India won't make the same mistake China made 20 years ago and have a coal led um, uh, based energy system, they'll go straight from no energy, biomass, um, via a little bit of coal, straight to renewables. They'll go straight from having very few cars to having electric vehicle based system. There's an emerging market energy leapfrog as the final part of this unstoppable force. Next slide, please. So um, just before I move on to the second aspect of this presentation, which is uh, what's the um, the the uh, the immovable object of the fossil fuel system. What share of traded debt is linked to the fossil fuel system? Um, and when I say traded, I mean the stuff that we can basically find on Bloomberg. It's about 15 trillion or 18 trillion dollars worth of debt that Bloomberg lists. 
So, Michael, I don't know if we have the results yet. Okay, so um, the answer, if you might have guessed from the presentation, is half. Half of traded debt is actually linked to the fossil fuel system. Um, incidentally, I forgot to give you the answer to the last question, which is that we think that global peak fossil fuel demand was 2019. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but the point to me is that uh, if you look at the Bloomberg stats, you allocate um, the uh, companies to different sectors, uh, then it turns out that actually half the traded fossil fuel uh, Half traded debt is actually in sectors linked to the fossil fuel system. So that means not just oil, coal and gas. It means electricity and cars and machinery sectors, uh, because there are many sectors linked to this system. So this then um, opens up the point, which is the fossil fuel system, of course, is absolutely huge. Um, and you can express that in lots of different ways. We've got a little, a neat little formula here. You've got fossil fuels themselves, physical infrastructure and financial markets. Um, you have, uh, as it were, assets uh, and flows. So you've got supply infrastructure and demand infrastructure of, uh, for the sake of argument, $10,000 billion of supply infrastructure. That's coal mines and, and oil wells and stuff. And we're still adding about a billion dollars a year of stuff um, to the supply infrastructure. We're still adding to the demand infrastructure and link then to this enormous fossil fuel system. You've got financial markets, uh, debt we just talked about, but also equity. Um, and, and then under the ground, you have the, the fossil fuels themselves um, with an asset value, uh, which again, it's got a very wide range depending upon your assumptions, um, but again, a huge asset system, which uh, which basically is felt or was felt to be immovable. Next slide, please. Um, so this then is substantiated to the observation which I made that the fossil fuel sector is the half of the corporate bond market. So supply, electricity, transportation industry, we talked it all up, it's about, um, it's about half the market. Next slide, please. Um, uh, similar story in equity markets, um, or it's actually about a quarter of equity markets. So you know, the supply, so uh, the electricity, transportation and industry all, again, adding up to a very large amount of financial market exposure. Um, OK, next slide, please. So we have established very quickly that it's a huge system. It's also an extremely flabby system. Um, so you have annual rents. This is rent, annual rents as a percent of GDP. Source of the World Bank, um, coal, oil, and gas. And you see it fluctuates, but it's basically been running around 2% of GDP uh, for, for about 50 years. So put yourself in the position of a fossil fuel producer. You get this rent, which is basically unearned wealth, which is flooding in 2% of, of global GDP every year. About 5% of people live in countries that get this stuff out of the ground and export large amounts of it. So um, that makes them incredibly flabby and it gives them lots of free money and um, they tend they choose to spend it on lots of inappropriate things. Um, uh, so that, anyway, that's the first aspect of waste. The second aspect of waste is that three quarters of fossil fuel en energy is actually wasted. Um, so uh, cars are notoriously bad um, users of energy. Only about 20 percent of the energy um, is going to move the car. Um, uh, power stations only use about 40 percent of the uh, intrinsic energy in the coal and gas in order to generate uh, electricity and so on and so forth. So it's a very, very wasteful system. Um, furthermore, it kills about 8 million people a year um, as a result of air pollution caused by fossil fuels. And that number is getting, you know, the World Bank used to talk, sort of talk about seven. And now increasingly, there's research coming out from more and more people actually demonstrating that the number of people being killed um, as a result of fossil fuel pollution is probably close to 8 million, uh, which is but then in context, global deaths a year of about 50 million. So it's about the world's third largest killer. Um, furthermore, this sector gets about $500 billion a year in annual subsidy and pays um, carbon taxes about 40 billion a year. So um, people often then say, well, how about excise taxes? But actually outside the um, transportation system, the, the uh, fossil fuel sector is paying about three euros a ton, source OECD, um, of, of taxation. Um, so. And, and the, the social cost of carbon is anything north of, well, uh, $51. We tend to use about $100. So it's desperately undertaxed, creating a massive externality cost that it imposes on society. Um, and furthermore, growth is incredibly low. So uh, growth is of the fossil fuel system is about 1% a year. Um, uh, and, and really, it's never faced a proper challenge in its life. So, you know, hydro was constrained, nuclear petered out quite quickly. 
Um, so we have a system that's very, very ripe for disruption. And incumbents do what incumbents always do. They don't notice that they're about to be destroyed. So incumbents are famously in denial. This is a very well-used chart. It's a chart from um, Alki Hoekstra on new solar additions actual, which is that blue line on the left going up very quickly on an exponential growth curve versus the forecasts of the uh, International Energy Agency, um, which are for flat growth every year. And the points to me, there are two points to be made really here. First of all, um, the International Energy Agency is a good proxy for the fossil fuel incumbency. So basically, they kind of summarize the views of Exxon and BP and their, their other um, supporters. Uh, it's by no means an objective analyst of the fossil fuel system. Um, and then secondly, uh, these people make the same mistake year after year for 20 years. I mean, as I said to one of them the other day, you know, if I made this mistake two years in a row, I would be embarrassed. But to do it 20 years in a row is quite extraordinary. Um, so th th this serves, I guess, as a proxy for the argument, which is that incumbents, incumbents are in denial about the, uh, the forces of change that they face. So next slide, please. So I'm going to try and tie these two together. We have we have an we, unstoppable force, and it's it's hitting this immovable, apparently immovable object. So the the question is, why now? Why are we excited about now being the moment of change? And the the the, the point then is that we can accept that in theory, cyclical shocks bring forward structural change. That's a kind of axiom, a, a, axiom, and we've seen it happen many many times. So what happens is you're getting cyclicality and a low growth system. Um, and then you get some kind of structural shock. And then by the time you go back to the uh, level of demand you were, you, you, you were at before, actually the, the structural shift has already taken place and you brought forward consequently in the moment of peak demand. And it's not, it's a kind of, not, it's not a theory. It's exactly what happened to the European electricity sector in 2007. Um, you had expectations of ever rising demand for fossil fuel uh, electricity generation in Europe in 2007. Furniture shock materialized. Certain wind at the time were tiny, about two or three percent of total generation. By the time demand came back again a few years later, uh, they were already six or seven percent. They were already taking all of the growth. And that's what happens just in general terms. So bear that in mind. Next slide, please. Um, because we uh, would argue, going back to the question I raised at the very beginning, that peak fossil fuel demand was probably 2019. And I've chosen here um, not in fact to take a carbon track of graph because anyone can make graphs. Um, I've taken uh, some data from the Shell Sky scenario, and you can see um, the oil sector demand illustrating the, the observation I made previously about structural shifts being brought forward by cyclical change. So the dotted line is what they were previously expecting of oil demand to rise, and you get the shock, and it never, in fact, recovers to the previous level. Um, so what, what actually then happens, and sorry, just furthermore to say, this is no longer, you know, when we started talking about this in Carbon Tracker a few years ago, um, we were seen as sort of you know, unusual and radical for making the observation that peak fossil fuel demand was coming. Um, it's now becoming increasingly commonplace. So DNVGL, for example, the Norwegian uh, energy uh, company, brought forward its date of peak fossil fuel demand from 2027 to 2019. Um, McKinsey uh, slightly wimped out in their forecast. They brought um, the their forecast is still 2027, but it's only 2% higher than 2019. Um, the BP, for example, then said that peak fossil, peak oil demand was, uh, was 2019 in their forecast. So people increasingly are shifting their thinking to realize that it probably was 2019. And it's good to see that 31% of this audience recognizes this as a, as a reasonable proposition. Uh, I think it'd be considerably higher in the population, sorry, lower in the population as a whole. Um, but the point to be made here really is, whether or not it's 2019 is slightly moot. The much more important point is we have reached a plateau, right? It's never going to rise rapidly from here again. The plateau will last for between, uh, I reckon, five to 10 years, this decade maximum. And then after the plateau comes a cliff. And then you can see that in this chart. After the plateau comes a cliff. And when you get the cliff, it really is game over for incumbents. Um, next slide, please. So um, the way we see it, um, I think you might have moved slides back again. This is the one. Thank you very much. The way we see uh, the world, in fact, at Carbon Tracker is that you have a series of, of, of peaks right across the system um, with the kind of peak of peaks being in 2019 for fossil fuels uh, and, and, oil, and, and oil. 
but actually it's preceded and um, by a whole series of other peaks. So we've already seen peak coal demand in 2013. Um, just as an aside, the IEA only worked out that peak coal demand um, uh, was 2013. In 2020, um, when their neo, their WIO came out seven years after the event. So you know, be aware of be aware of that fact. Uh, you have peak EMP capex 2014, peak uh, conventional car demand in 2017. Again, we were seen as radical when we said it was peak ICE car demand. Now you know, we have the chairman of Volkswagen saying um, the ICE or the the future is electric vehicles. So you are seeing a series of peaks in one sector after the next. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this then brings me on to the great Campanale primary thesis, which is that um, peak demand means stranded assets. I mean, it's sort of obvious, but it needs to be spelt out, which is that when you get to the peak, particularly if you're a dumb incumbent, if you expect more demand growth, you build the demand growth. When that growth doesn't materialize, there's a gap between your expectations and reality, and that gap is stranded assets. Um, so peak demand means stranded assets, and it means stranded assets immediately. Uh, next slide, please. And, and in fact, stranded assets is only one part of the puzzle. So as you move from rising demand at the top end of the cost curve um, to falling demand with overcapacity, you move you move down, you know, economics 101 to the variable cost curve, and you have three consequences. You get stranded assets we talked about, um, but you also get lower profits right across the entire fossil fuel system. And you also get, and it's interesting that it's the biggest part of the puzzle, you also get lost rent. So all these wonderful petrostates, which have been enjoying free money of 2% a year of, off the back of the laboring poor, um, they're no longer going to have that free money, uh, sadly. So no more golden bathtubs. Okay, next slide. Um, before we come on to the sort of final uh, conclusions, as it were. Um, by how much did U.S. coal stocks, what I mean, by how much did U.S. coal company uh, market capitalization or the index fall at the time when global coal demand was 3% below its peak? So if we see global coal demand peaked in 20, 2013 um, uh, and, then, and then drifted down, actually bounced back a little bit and then has been drifting down again. By how much did coal, coal index, the coal in, U.S. coal index fall? 3%, 10%, 50%, or 90%? Well, we've launched that poll, King's Mill, and uh, over half the audience have voted. I'm just going to leave it up a little bit longer. Three quarters are there. Getting on up into the 80% mark now. Okay. I'm going to shut that poll and share the results. Um, so 59% of the audience believe it's uh, 50%. Um, you can enlighten us on the real answer. Uh, sure. I mean, in fact, I have a graph of this a little bit later, but the, I mean, the answer is 90% or in fact 95%. Um, so the, 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 the US coal sector by 2016, which is three years after peak demand, had already collapsed. Um, and, and, and in fact, it bounced a little bit, but then it collapsed again. And now they've given up, in fact, even measuring it. And this then it illustrates the, uh, the, the point, financial markets react early. I mean, everything that I have just laid out is, with all due respect to myself, completely obvious. Um, and um, financial markets know it, and financial markets consequently react early. You know, financial markets don't wait until you have lost 90% of your market share um, in order to sell the stock. They don't even wait until demand has gone down by 5%. They sell, actually, as a rule, shortly before the top. And you see this, I mean, I illustrate it here with uh, electricity sector in Europe peaking in 2007, uh, the, uh, the global coal sector peaking in 2011, um, uh, a couple of years before global coal demand peaks, uh, and then the uh, global oil, so the EMEA oil services index peaking uh, in 2013, again, before even global uh, uh, oil services demand had peaked. So you get financial markets which, which react very, very early at the first sort of, Whiff of a peak. Next slide, please. And in fact, it's even more powerful than that. And I, I, I rely here on the um, on the observations made by by George Soros, uh, uh, upon which he built his very extensive fortune. Um, that that uh, financial markets don't merely uh, react to change, but they drive it. 
And this point was once more emphasized by uh, Larry Fink at the start of 2020, uh, when he somewhat belatedly and slowly began to wake up to what was going on. Um, and re reflexivity is the point re that speeds up change. So, so what happens is the financial markets take money away from the old system. They remove capital from the from the oil, from the oil companies and the coal companies, and therefore they can't grow anymore, and they're forced to rethink their strategy. In the meantime, it floods money into the new energy technologies, um, you know, Tesla and EV and hydrogen, um, and that then reduces their cost of capital. They can raise money extremely quickly, and that means that they can grow even more rapidly. So, so for reflexivity, speeds up change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is the final part of this little presentation. What do you do? Um, and, and I think uh, I'm going to start with with what the financial markets in their wisdom thought the answer was, which was ESG. ESG is not the answer. ESG is greenwashing in the most part, not all of it, but a large part of ESG is just greenwashing. And much more importantly, for fundamental investors, ESG doesn't help you make or lose money. So this is indeed the Dow Jones US Coal Index. Uh, and you can see my observations substantiated 2016, it's lost uh, over 90%. Um, if you engaged with the coal companies in 2011 and sought to encourage them to reduce their carbon footprint and bought the best ones with the lowest carbon footprint um, and the most um, able management teams which, which told the best story, you would have lost just as much money as if you bought the worst ones. And, and that's the point, which is that this is a real fundamental shift and, and, and thinking you can understand and make money out of it through ESG or carbon footprinting or any of these other fancy tools that consultants sell is simply incorrect. Next slide, please. Um, so what should you do? Let me conclude on two two points. The um, the first point, and sorry, it's a slightly crowded slide for this uh, for this framework, but you know, in Warren Buffett's immortal phrase, it's much easier to shoot the horse than buy the car. It's much easier, in fact, to find losers than winners. So the first thing to do is you avoid the losers. That means incumbent fossil fuel companies in every single guise. It means petro states, um, large numbers of which will inevitably uh, uh, not survive this transition. Um, and, 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 and it's quite easy. You just avoid all of this stuff and you think very seriously about what are the consequences of uh, decline in those countries and those sectors. And my final slide, next slide please, is you've got to go out and find the new growth stories. I mean, this was a slightly fresher argument um, when when the price of uh, EV and, and hydrogen stocks hadn't gone through the roof as it did in 2020. Um, but it's nevertheless a valid point, which is that you've got huge amounts of new growth to come. I mean, we're only in fact at the start of this new energy system. So there's, we're going to have a tenfold increase in, the, in, in solar, a hundredfold increase in the number of uh, electric vehicles. Then you've got all of the infrastructure around that. And then if you want to start to think slightly outside the box, you've got um, companies which are producing the, um, uh, the, the, the systems like the cables. You've got countries like India or Turkey or Thailand, uh, which are very fossil fuel dependent and now going to become much more dependent, uh, much more able to, uh, to, to, to prosper upon their own energy resources. So there are many, many ways in which to play this growth story. So I think I should stop there. Michael, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kingsville. Um, a, a really rapid canter through um, an important area. We have a, a, n a number of uh, comments and questions here. Um, Shan Turnbull is asking from Australia, uh, Mark and Kingsville, do you have any metrics that reveal to what extent carbon tracking drives the foresight of financial markets? Sorry, I don't actually understand the question. Uh, so you, uh, I believe what Chen is driving at is how much do you think the work that you're doing in terms of carbon tracking and assets is driving the insights and foresights that the financial markets are using for this pricing? Well, I should be, I should be, Mark's too modest. I think what Mark Campanale has done 10 years ago is kick off the entire reflexivity process of financial markets um, because it was he who, who woke people up to what was going to happen. Um, and, and that has, has helped change. I mean, to put the numbers on that, in 2020, which was kind of the year that financial markets woke up, the, um, uh, the, the fossil fuel index was down 35% and the renewables index was up 130%. You know, so 
but it took time for people to wake up. But I think Mark was the one um, sounding the signal. I, just to add to that, um, well, I don't know how much was down to me, but uh, the divestment movement, I've got to say, uh, when we first published this report, we printed 100 copies, Michael. I think you ended up with one of them. Um, yeah. Naomi Klein ended up with one of them, and she gave it to Bill McKibben, and he wrote his famous um, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math article in Rolling Stone magazine, which I think was Rolling Stone magazine's most downloaded article on this on this topic. That that in turn led to the Do the Math Tour, which was um, a phrase taken from the report. And students from around the world then started doing what students do, which is annoying, and uh, protesting and, and, and sitting on college lawns and or inside bursars' offices. Uh, forcing universities to really get to grips with, with divesting from fossil fuels. And actually, more importantly, what that did, whether it was the right thing to do or not, was it forced the fund managers who looked after the assets, whether it was a pension fund or an endowment, forced the fund managers to look at it. So we received huge numbers of inquiries from all kinds of fund managers in around 2012, 13, 14, about what are these stranded assets? What, what is the fossil fuel reserves? And even still, we're asked by banks and investment managers to, to go through this. Um, it just forced all kinds of fund managers to review what they view, what you know, review the question of what happens to the business model of these fossil fuel majors if most of their assets, fossil fuels, have to stay in the ground and the the fixed assets of the company, the the pipelines and the refineries and the coal mines and so on have to be written down. What are the financial consequences of it? So it was really that kind of trigger effect. And by the way, I just want a quick correction when you asked me the question earlier, um, Michael, about the source of the data, it's of course the um, IPCC, not the UNFCCC. Um, the IPCC is the main source of the data on, on warming outcomes. Uh, Jasper Sky is also curious, uh, what long-term energy systems transition model uh, does Carbon Tracker use? So um, I use lots is the answer. And the one I think is most credible, it, it, I mentioned a couple of times, is DMVGL. Um, but I'll make a, a much more important point than, than, than any of that, which is that nobody is able to forecast the future, the long-term future of energy with any credibility. Um, and, and I'll give you one little factoid to illustrate that. So, um, there's a book that a lot of people in the UK have read called, um, I was reading it yesterday, called uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, written by David Mackay in 2008. And David Mackay was a you know, professor of physics at Cambridge and the chief government advisor on uh, the energy and uh, on, on what to do with, with the problem of global warming. He, wrote, he was probably the best informed person in the United Kingdom in 2008. He was also a very honest man, very impressive man. He did his very, very best to work out an answer, renewables-based answer, but his his conclusion was the conclusion of despair, which is that we can't do it, we don't have enough stuff. And, and that was written in 2008, and, and, you know, actually his numbers now have been completely transformed by the collapse in the cost of solar and wind um, and, and batteries for that matter. So he didn't even consider solar PV as a sensible solution in that book in 2008. He didn't bother to calculate what the size of the resource was globally. Um, he thought the wind resource was 10 times smaller than people now think it is. So, you know, things have changed incredibly rapidly in 12 years time. And, and, and I would make one very simple observation, which is that you have these technologies, which are now big enough to move the needle, are now absolutely everywhere. We have a hundred times more renewable energy than we require. About half of it is economical today. About all of that will be economical by the end of the decade. Um, you know, I have no idea how the detail plays out. All I can tell you is that when you get a massive source of really cheap energy, humanity is extremely good at figuring out ways of exploiting it. So I think that's the point. And that's why I think you need to frame this in terms of the unstoppable force um, really eventually moving that apparently immovable object and you know everyone's forecast they do their best i guess all the numbers add up but they're really not not worth the paper they're written on after two years
Um, you said that ESG was not the answer. Uh, Alexander Lehman is curious about the how effective do you think is disclosure, for example, uh, GCFD by financial firms to encourage divestment? It depends what it is you're disclosing. So under scenario analysis, it's amazing how many fossil fuel companies say the only scenario is continued growth in demand for fossil fuels, hence growth in supply. They never use the scenario. The real scenario they should be using in the TCFD is let's assume a 50% drop in, in prices and demand for fossil fuels. What happens to my company when demand and uh, collapses and more importantly, prices collapse? Give us that as a scenario. And then on top of that, Give us a scenario where you have to write down your fixed assets, bring that forward early and bring forward retirement of your fixed assets. Of course, you never see a scenario in a TCFD that gets anywhere close to it. So now the principle of it is correct, but why would a company disclose something which is fundamentally not in its interest? And I'm in favor of mandatory disclosure, just so long as what's being made mandatory is the relevant disclosure. Being Making something Mandatory. If you're saying it's man, you know, there's a whole discussion about making TCFD mandatory. If it's mandatory and all you're doing is saying, yeah, there's going to be continued growth in demand for fossil fuels, which is, we believe, fundamentally wrong. How helpful is that? Yeah. Um, got a question here from Robert Pay. You show fossil fuel prices are likely to decline sharply. Uh, since energy is fundamental to much economic enterprise, will it give a major advantage to countries that are slow? to convert to other energy sources. And Donald McRae is also curious, oil is the source of many useful essential products other than fossil fuel. Have you factored this into your calculations? So, so if I can answer this question. So um, it, it is indeed right to say that energy prices will decline. And, and this actually is really exciting um, observation because it means that um, we, well, to put it bluntly, we can have more stuff um, at lower cost. And, and much more importantly, um, it means that the people of the emerging markets, the energy poor, the 3 billion people who don't have access to clean cooking, the 1 billion people who don't have access to electricity, it means that they can have access to uh, relatively large amounts of energy at much, much lower cost. So that's one of the reasons why this is extremely profoundly just transition. Um, I mean, the idea that somehow that means that it helps fossil fuel um, users to benefit, I don't really understand that. I mean, you know, if, if you produce coal at the moment and you're trying to flog it to, you know, from Australia to India, uh, you know, and the Indians can, can produce energy at <laughs> half the price today and a quarter of the price in five years time. I mean, you know, why would they buy it? So, you know, the price can be quite low, but it, it's not going to, it's not going to help you very much. Um, and then there's another point about oil and the other wonderful uses of oil. Um, look, this is, I think this is, goes back to the, to the key point, which is we're not talking about, uh, zero demand for this stuff. We're just talking about declining demand. So, um, and, and it's actually decline that, re that wreaks the, the damage for incumbents. Um, and people often say to me, look, you know, even in your models, oil demand was 100 million barrels of oil a day back in 2019. And, you know, it's gone down to 90 and it's going back to 95 and it's still going to be about 100 for a few years. Therefore, it's fine. I mean, that's just incorrect because, you know, look at what the illustration I just made with the coal sector. You know, coal demand peaks in 2013, 2014 goes down a bit, recovers to almost the level it was, and then has fallen a bit. But in the meantime, the, the incumbents have been wiped out several times. Um, and, and that's the point, which is that incumbents are, are, are damaged not by um, uh, the, um, they're just damaged by decline in demand, and decline in demand happens as the big areas of demand start falling. Um, and, and therefore, sorry, to come back to a very specifically um, uh, uh, oil. So I did, we did a big piece of analysis about the, um, petrochemical industry and whether or not Petchem can sell oil. And I can't remember all the details, but in very broad terms, um, 10 million barrels of oil a day being used for Petchem. And that's basically where all the growth is meant to come from. So the 10 was meant to go to, I don't know, 12 or 13 or something. Um, but you've got the remaining, you've got 50 going into transportation. And the moment the transportation demand starts dropping, and you can see the maths, right? 
you have to you would have to grow your pet chem demand by five times as much as your transportation demand is falling. And that just ain't going to happen because actually pet chem itself will will face the same kind of uh, regulatory type pressure. So the way to think about the way that this, this shift is happening, I, I liken it to a tide. The fossil fuel system is an enormous island, um, and, and it's, but it's an island that's sinking, and the tide is rising. And what's happening is that each area of the fossil fuel system is just getting swamped by the tide one after the next. And you've got a little bloke at the top of the hill waving a flag going, I'm the plastics industry, I'm fine. And, and it's just bollocks, you're not fine. You know, the entire system is getting submerged and you, you, know, you might be the last one to get submerged, but you're still going to go. So, well, um, we've really run off time, but I just uh, wouldn't mind just one quick question. The, we've, uh, you, you mentioned your, uh, Jasper Scott, you mentioned an acronym on your lawyer, long-term energy transition model, DMGBL. Could you just repeat that slowly? So it's a Norwegian company. Uh, actually, they just rename themselves, make it a bit easier. They just they're called DNV now, um, and they release a piece called um, Energy Transition Outlook once a year. Um, and the next one's due up quite soon. So uh, and, and they've got very very good data, and it's very detailed, and it goes forward um, to to 2050. Um, uh, and and um, yeah, I mean it's interesting. But, but as I say, you know, all of these models suffer from, and anyone trying to do modeling suffers from the endemic problem, which is that you, you, you basically model the system we have. So it's a bit like, you know, the observation that Ford made or allegedly made in, in 1900, 1910, that people said when asked what they wanted, they wanted faster horses, not a car. You know, yeah. we've got new, new technologies coming in and, and inevitably current models are based upon extrapolation of the old system. Well, we've uh, sadly run out of time. There are a number of comments which will all be passed on to you, but uh, Andrew Ross uh, quite uh, cattily remarks that uh, there's a point here. Financial services are so ahead of the curve. Why can they not value natural capital and biodiversity? So hopefully we'll see biodiversity trackers soon. Uh, we could have spent a lot more time, I think. Uh, Hugh Purser is curious about the geopolitical implications on the petro states. Charles Perry is curious about an abolition of combustion of fossil fuels. Um, you know, and I myself am very interested in what, what this might do vis-a-vis -vis the carbon markets and carbon prices. So there's a heck of a lot to chat about, uh, but we have run to time, sadly. Uh, and therefore, I need to really give three quick rounds of thanks to everyone. Uh, firstly, to our sponsors, as ever, uh, tolerant and wide-ranging. So absolutely fantastic. And thank you uh, for being uh, so kind and allowing us to touch on such an important subject that affects everyone. Uh, secondly, to the audience, you've been very vibrant today, um, and I do know there are a number of detailed questions. Um, your emails will be given to Mark and Kingsville, and uh, very, uh, very much a look ahead. We have a busy week ahead of us, uh, despite it being a four-day week. As ever, go to the website to see things that you'd like to see. Uh, and finally, if I may, uh, both at Kingsville and Mark, you've done tremendous work over the years, and you know we genuinely do admire it. You took on a a subject that a lot of people wanted to sweep under the carpet and you've turned it into something very very important and so i, I uh, would like to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us today unfortunately the technology does not permit me to open the floodgates of applause so i bring along my free and karmic clapper uh, which is the best that i can do to give you sort of the audience feedback but thank you so much for this we hope to have you uh, track your progress perhaps by having you on again uh, later this year or next. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.